Amen. It's good to see everybody here this evening. Uh, we welcome the folks in listening via sermon audio. And we certainly would love you to drop us a line every now and again. Miles at the Grace Church. That's M I L E S at the Grace Church. I'm sure Anton has that already on this. It's uh, dot I Miles at the Grace Church dot I. What were you saying to me? Oh, don't I? Oh, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let me finish. <laughs> and so we welcome also the Grace Church in Ackworth, Georgia, USA. And uh, we're delighted that we can all be together as we grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Tonight I, I want to call this message again part of our series in Philippians it's the next verse from where we left off but I want to call it thinking about Jesus thinking about Jesus and if you've got your Bibles with you uh, we'll go to the book of Philippians and there in the book of Philippians we find ourselves in chapter 4 and last week we looked at verse 6 and 7, be careful for nothing, <clears throat> worry about nothing. That's what the Bible says, worry about nothing. Nothing is no thing, very exclusive word, no thing, nothing else. There's no thing, there's no thing, there's not something, there's no thing. Worry about no thing, worry about, don't worry about anything. And so... Uh, worry about nothing but in everything there's nothing and now there's everything with everything with four words prayer supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God and so prayer is going before God supplication is going before him with an urgency this is the alternative to worrying instead of worrying go to God with prayer supplication but in the midst of the supplication asking him urgently thanksgiving Giving thanks unto the Lord and bring your requests unto Him. And then the peace of God, which passes all comprehension, all understanding, will garrison your mind or keep your mind protected like a military guard. Would you love that? Yeah. A military guard over your mind? Well, it's ours. We're children of the great King. We're adopted into the family of God. These promises are ours. And so. Shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, which brings us to verse 8. Verse 8 says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things father we'd ask in jesus name that you'd shut us in with thyself this evening move with power in our meeting lord that we would be meeting with you we would be drawn lord we ask by your spirit into your very presence we know your presence is with us we're gathered in the name of jesus but lord we'd ask that you would help us to understand this word help me to preach this word help us to hear this word in Jesus name yes can I tell you this and it's not a secret and you know it but believers are in a war and our biggest war and battle place goes on for our mind we are in the world but we're not off the world we belong to a different kingdom we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ but there's a continual bombarding of our minds that goes on day after day our minds are being bombarded Books, magazines, television, billboards, movies, internet. And the goal of this anti-God world system is to cause us to not think like Christians, but to think like the world. And if you think like the world and act like the world, you can say you're a Christian, but you're off the world. And there's the world, the flesh, and the devil, the three great enemies of the gospel. And we're called out of this world. We were in the world, but we're called out of this world. And we're to live under a different kingdom. The kingdom was a government. Mm -hmm. And we're in the kingdom, the government of God. Mm -hmm. 
So Solomon, he recognized the age-long conflict, and he wrote in Proverbs, Proverbs 23 and verse 7, will you hear this? He says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Did you hear that? As a man or a woman thinks in their heart, that's what they are. Do you want to know what a man actually is, what a person actually is? Well, Solomon has just given us the test for a person. A person, you don't judge a person by what they run around saying. We can all talk a good talk. It's not the measure of your stature, not stature, but the measurement of you and what you talk about. Although we should talk about the right things. But the test of a person is not what you or I talk about, it's what we think about. As a man thinks in his heart, that's what he is. So is he. Guys, this is, we could dwell on this one all night, and in a sense, we're going to. But that's what we are, what we're thinking about. We are what our, think, what, what our thought life is. And you know the greatest sins in the believer's life not, is not the area of all these external things, but it's the area of our thought life. There's the world between our ears. And there's a battleground in there. And so the, the whole classification of sin, there's a whole classification that can be called the sins of the mind. You know, when Lucifer sinned, he started with his thoughts. Pride. He thought he was greater than God. Uh, you know, that's a sin of the mind. What's lust? That's a sin of the mind. You don't just wake up and start say, oh, um, I've lost. You've thought of it lust. You've lusted in your mind. Lust. The sin of the mind. Covetousness. Greediness for other things. The sin of the mind. Greed itself. The sin of the mind. Discouragement. The sin of the mind. The world and its warfare goes on inside our heads. We could go on and on. And these sins are more real to a child of God than the sins of adultery. Most of us have cleaned up that act. We don't want to rob banks. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> but our warfare goes on in our minds. There's where the battlefield is. In there, what are we thinking about? And so, the... The Apostle Paul is concerned here that we would think of it the right things and uh, uh, that, that we would have the right approach to our minds. And it's crucial for each of us to bring our thought life into submission to the Lord Jesus Christ and to learn to think biblically about life and to learn that uh, sin usually, if not always, begins. The mind. Oftentimes the Bible calls the mind the heart. Jesus said this in, in Matthew 7 and verse 20 and the following verses. Okay, right through to verse 23. He said, that which comes out of a mind, man, that which defiles the man from, for with, from within, out of the heart. You hear this? Out of the heart proceed evil thoughts. The heart in the Bible is the same as the mind. That's the seat, the control seat. Out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil come from within and defile the man. Who said that? Jesus said that. That's the teaching of the God man. That's the man who came. That's, the God, that's God who came from heaven and became one of us to explain things to us, among other things. And he says, it's out of your mind that these things go. Mm. So nobody commits these outward sins without having first committed them in the mind or in the heart. 
And so, if we want to grow in grace, we've got to learn to do battle on the thought level. Now, Philippians 4 and verse 8, Paul exhorts us to develop uh, an authentic thought life, Christian thought life. Now, let's read this together again. Chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Mm -hmm. Finally, brethren, he's bringing his, this letter to an end. So he says, now here, finally, brethren, I love the way he's already said this, finally, brethren, in chapter 3. In chapter 3, he says in verse 1, Finally, brethren, rejoice in the Lord. It's like some preachers I know, he doesn't know when to stop. <laughs> and so, but I'm glad he doesn't stop. I'm glad he's brought this in. He says again, finally, brethren, finally, brethren. Let's keep up to you, lads. You folks in Ackworth don't understand what a good cup of tea is. A little bit snotty cup. It's <laughs> for the preacher. <laughs> ah, no. Finally, brother, whatsoever things are true. That's what he says. Think of it this. Whatsoever things are true. Look that word up. Alethes in the Greek language. Alethes. And it has a sense of true in conforming to reality. In the final analysis, I discovered that whatever God says on any given subject is true. That's why you need the right God. You'll be led astray if you don't have the right God. Well, what do you mean have the right God? Well, everybody is intent on in making up their own wee God. And a God that they like and a God that they want to behave this way and not that way and all like that. So, we need the God of the Bible, and what he says is true. He is the unchanging God, and his word is unchanging, and it's holy, and it's the final test for truth. And what did Jesus say about truth? You've heard him say this, John 14, verse 6. He says, I am the truth. He didn't say, I am a truth, or uh, the truth has been revealed to me. He says, no, he says, I am the truth. Now, when Jesus said this, this means that everything he said is true. And we know that's true because he raised from the dead. Listen to me, if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, if he didn't come out of that grave, you don't have to believe a word he said. But because he was raised from the dead, it means he was sinless. See, sin brings death and the authority of death is because of sin but Jesus was sinless and death couldn't hold him and since he was sinless that means he never lied he never told a, a, an untruth and he says I am the truth and that's proven that he's the truth because he raised from the dead he's out of the grave and so I can believe every single thing he said and every single thing he said is true and so whatsoever things are true think on me well how do we do that? Well, what has Jesus said? Jesus has said everything that's true. Here's one of the ways we think on these things, is think about the things that Jesus said. And think about the one himself who is the truth. He is the revelation of the truth. It's not just true, it's the truth. Anything outside of him is false. Think on these things. Whatsoever things are true. In John 14, 17, speaking of the Holy Spirit, Jesus said that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is the Spirit of truth. And then in John 17, 17, Jesus says, Thy word is truth. The Bible is truth. The Spirit is truth. I am the truth. And so this is a wonderful, lovely arrangement. The Spirit of truth will lead us to the word of truth where we will discover the one who is the truth. Isn't that great? That's enough to make a Presbyterian shout, amen. <laughs> Pity we don't have any Presbyterians in here now. <laughs> ah, near enough. <laughs> and so, unfortunately today, there's little concern about the truth in Christian circles. There was one preacher I read, he observed, he wasn't saying that, but he said that, People no longer ask, is this true? But they ask, will it work? Not 
is your doctrine true, but will it work? Will it draw people? Oh, you don't introduce stuff in your church that, well, it might be true, but will confuse the people. It's like you don't introduce the doctrine of election in church because people wouldn't understand that. Wouldn't understand what? That God chose them apart from their works before they were born. God chose them. Well, you couldn't tell people that. Why not? The Bible says it. It's true. It's the truth. People couldn't handle it. It's not a practical doctrine, is it? Who cares whether it's practical? Who cares whether it doesn't build a church? It'll tell you what. It'll build believers. It'll put backbone into believers. It'll put purpose into believers. The people say they don't care whether it's true, but does it work? Here's another thing they say. How would it make me feel? Only preach something that will make me feel. Oh, listen. People say, well, truth, well, well, what is true? Just whatever works and whatever makes me feel good. Our church must be, we've got three, four, five, six, seven, eight thousand people. We must be preaching the truth. Oh, sure, the Mormons have got big, big churches all over the place. They're not preaching the truth. Just because you can build a crowd doesn't mean that you're building a church. No, I, I'm glad we're growing here. And I'm folks in Ackworth, I, I'm glad you're growing. And if you're not seeing the growth, you won't see the growth. Yeah. We're, we're, we're not against growth. We want to see growth. But that's not the proof that we're preaching the truth. We'll preach the truth whether it brings in the people or not. And so, but too often people want emotionalism and they want pragmatism and they don't want to be divisive or offensive and uh, they don't really care nowadays about the truth. What a shame. Terrible shame. So whatsoever things are true, think on these. How do I do that? I think of a Jesus. Would you now think of a Jesus? Whatsoever things are true. This is a good set of scriptures. This is a good verse actually to memorize. Whatsoever things are true. Julian and I have sat and gone through them and worked them through and tried committing them into our heart. Whatsoever things are true true think of these occupy your mind with that which is true and then he says look keep reading here verse 8 he says whatsoever things are honest well isn't that like the word true well yeah it is it's it's a greek word samnos and that also means honorable whatsoever things are honorable whatsoever things are honest there's no professor. He wasn't writing everything he said, but a lot of his stuff is really worth reading. William Barclay. Now, he's liberal in some things, and God bless him. But he has a lot of good insights and a lot of good background and stuff. I usually consult him. It's actually on words. And he said that's the word which characteristically was used of gods and temples of the gods. When used to describe a man, it describes a person as it has been said, who moves through the world as if he were the temple of God. That's what that word honest is. How am I going to think about that which is honest and honorable? Where do I find a man who walks through this world honorably in perfection? Well, no, I only know of one person who's moved through the world as though he were the temple of God and his name is Jesus Christ and he moved through the world as the temple of God like the temple of God because he is the temple of God he is the meeting place with God that's where the Jews met with God at the temple and Jesus is the mediator he is the temple it's only in Christ that we meet with God it's only in Christ where the atonement is that's it was only in the temple where the Jews who get the forgiveness for sins. So whatsoever things are honorable. Honorable. Moving through life is in a the dignity of holiness. Only one man who's ever done it. And that's Jesus. Think on him. Think on him. What do you want to do with your thought life? As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. What are you going to spend your time thinking about? You ever, you're sitting there quiet. Oh, this is so good to be quiet. 
You know, you don't always have to be surrounded by noise. You don't always have to have the TV on. You don't always have to have noise. But you, do you ever just sit quiet and think? What do you think about? Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest or honorable, and whatsoever things are just. Greek word, diakos, and that, refer, that refers to that which conforms to the perfect standard of God's righteousness. And we know from the Bible, from especially from the book of, of Romans, that the good works that God requires do not come from our good intentions. But good works, by the way, are right. And they're righteous. But to do them, we originate the doing of them by faith. But just, this word just, diapos, describes whatever is in perfect harmony with God's eternal unchanging standards. That's revealed in Scripture. What? Yeah, righteous. Do you know what a righteous man is? A righteous man, a righteous woman, is in perfect harmony, living in perfect, perfect harmony with God's eternal unchanging standards as revealed in the Bible. Oh no, I don't want to hear that. I'm guilty. I'm not a righteous person. Oh, really? That's what Romans 3 verse 10 says. There is none righteous, no, not one. There's not one of us have lived in perfect conformity to the standard of God. This brings me back to the gospel, where I realize in righteousness, oh my, if I have my thinking straight here, I'm not righteous, but there is one who is. This is good news. His name is Jesus, and he is my righteousness. First Peter 3 and verse 18, it says, for Christ also hath suffered, has once suffered for sin, the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God. Jesus is the just one. Think on these things. Christ is the just one. He perfectly conformed himself to the standard of God's righteousness. And as the just one, he died for the unjust. Are you unjust? Well, in yourself, yes, you are. Are you just? Are you righteous? Yes, you are in Christ. But how can I be righteous in Christ when I still sin? That's the wonderful thing. You are, uh, what is it? Simuli Pacador. No, Simuli Justus a Pacador. Already we're not there. <laughs> we're already righteous. Pacator, not Dor. We are already righteous even though we're still sinners. Still sinners. But we're righteous in Christ and all his righteousness is given to us. He has met the standard. Think on these things. Read this with me again. Let's look at it again. Verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, Jesus is the truth, because he's the truth. Everything he said is true, because he's the truth. Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, and whatsoever things are pure, yeah, there's something else to think about. The things that are pure. Hagnos is the Greek word there. That means pure is something which is free from stain, free from defilement. It is something that will not contaminate. It is something which is morally pure, outwardly and inwardly pure. And it means, for in practical terms, to be pure, to keep yourself pure, it means keeping our bodies undefiled by abstaining from sexual sin. Did you know that we, until you get old, are continually harassed in the night by impure thoughts? And we are told to counteract that beating ourselves over the back with a big brush. But by thinking of it, that which is pure. Isn't that wonderful? That's genius. Paul gives a strong warning to 
Jeremy is saying that sometimes we forget that there are warnings because we preach grace all the time, but there are warnings. Ephesians 4, verse 17 through to 24. This is a pretty modern version I'm going to read from. It said, Do not let immorality or impurity or greed even be named among you as is proper among the saints. And uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry I gave you the wrong scripture, but this will do. Uh, there must be no filthiness or silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather the giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you. Did you hear that? We skip over these scriptures. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Do you want to be tied up with the things? It brings wrath on them, the onside. Therefore do not be partakers with them, for you were formerly of the darkness, but now you are light, and the Lord walk as children of the light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Oh, do I ever need a Savior? I need the gospel every day, my friend. I need to learn what the gospel teaches me. I need to apply the gospel and think about the things that are pure and not let my mind run loose thinking about all manner of mischief and nonsense and things that bring the wrath of God and so do you discipline your thinking in the gospel discipline it then it says whatsoever things are pure and then whatsoever things are lovely prosify whatsoever things are lovely there was a wee girl around about once she was having trouble sleeping. And she told her mother, came down and told her mother, and her mother read her out of the scripture, read her her say, chapter 4 of Philippians, and told her to go back to sleep and think about something lovely. In the morning, the mother asked, Did you do that, darling? She did, she says. She says, Well, what did you think about? You thought about things that were lovely. She said, I did. She said, I thought about my teddy bear and my dollies and ice cream. <laughs> it would be lovely to be a child again. I don't want to think of it, Donnie's. Teddy bears I've kind of been through. <laughs> this idea of thinking about things that are lovely has, has with it this, this notion of thinking about that which is admirable or agreeable to behold or consider. Whatsoever things are lovely, think of these. Who was the most lovely person who ever lived? Do you know of anybody more lovely than him? They say Alexander the Great was a lovely man. He had perfume that came out of him. Actually, he's a lovely man, but he'd have killed you. Of course, it's not that idea. That's not too lovely. But Jesus walked around. He was lovely to children. How do I know that? Because children loved him. He had time for children. That's a lovely person. Time for children. But not only was he lovely to children, he was lovely to women. And those kind of names, not kind of age, women. Women were despised. Women weren't allowed. Well, they weren't allowed to give testimony in a court, in a court of law. Or, or, or a dog had more rights than a woman oftentimes. But Jesus surrounded himself with women. In fact, it was some wealthy women who financed his ministry. He kept them going. He was always, always lovely. Great. He's lovely. But since he's lovely, let me ask you, has he been lovely to you? Well, he has. How do you think you got here tonight? I drove, yeah. How come you didn't rack the car? Because he's lovely. He's lovely. He's cared for you and he's gone to the cross for you. He's lovely. He's borne your sins for you because he's lovely. He's risen again for you because he's lovely. Think of it all that he's done for you and you'll know he's lovely. But not only that, think of all that he's doing for you right now. He's in heaven right now, appearing before the Father for you. Isn't he lovely? Have you ever told him, Lord Jesus, you're lovely? You really are lovely. 
How could we say that to him? Because we're too busy. We're too hush, rushed and hurried and, 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 and we just don't have time to say anything to him except good night, Lord, and bless my soul. We're taking time with him. Oh, what opportunities we are missing. Go before him and tell him he's lovely. Think on these things. Think on him who is true and honest. One old preacher said it this way, he said, anything that dims my vision of Christ or takes away my taste for the Bible or cramps my prayer life, listen to this, anything that dims my vision of Christ and takes away my taste for the Bible or cramps my prayer life or makes Christian work difficult is wrong for me. I must, as a Christian, turn away from it. And whatsoever things are of good report, think on these things. Euphemos is the Greek word that refers to that which is well spoken of, or a good report is praiseworthy, or laudable, or high regarded, or well thought of. It's something or someone that deservedly enjoys a good reputation. Well, what has that got to do with Jesus? A good report. Well, let me ask you, what do you think of Jesus? Don't answer me, but answer yourself. What do you think of Jesus? You personally. Did you know, can I tell you, they think very well of him in heaven. They do. They think well of him in heaven. You know, Mark 7, 37, there's a little scripture tucked away, which is almost forgotten about. It's a description of Jesus. In the middle of a verse, it says, he has done all things well. He has done all things well. Oh, he's, he's got a good report. He's got a good reputation. Think on him. Think on the things that give him a good report. Think on that. Don't just think of the things I'm naming tonight and all these things. You've got, I'm giving you material tonight which will revolutionize your thought life. Take it and run with it and expand it. But the best report I ever heard was the gospel. <laughs> he, who is the gospel? It's Jesus. He is the gospel. He is God's good news from heaven about himself. You meet Jesus, you meet God. You hear Jesus, you hear God. You learn from Jesus, you learn from God. A good report came from heaven. And how is it then, in spite of all the grace that we've been given, we find fault? Well, and other people's shortcomings. I'm going to say something. I don't like to say anything that dates a message. But this last two days, I have been disgusted reading so called Christians and their comments about Robert Williams. Mm -hmm. I've been disgusted. The poor man hanged himself. He cut his wrists, that didn't work, and then he hanged himself. And I have followed links of Christians and their comments and all like that. Not all. Folks in Eckworth have held the line here. I was proud of them. But boy, I tell you. Robin Williams is burning in hell. Robin Williams did a pack to the devil. Go away from me, you laggards that talk like that about a poor, desperate man who killed himself. He was in league with the devil. Well, weren't you until you were saved? If you are saved, people who would take that kind of attitude about a poor creature who was in torment and ended his life burning in hell as if they were glad. Is there any grace left amongst Christians at all? Is there anybody saved by grace? If you're saved by grace, you'll be gracious. Back in 1892, John Hyde boarded a ship in New York Harbor and set out for India. He was on his way to the Punjab, northern India. His goal was to proclaim the gospel to people who hadn't heard. And when he arrived there, he was supposed to learn the local language, but he was kind of partially deaf. He was only a young man, but he was partially deaf. 
so he couldn't really hear their language being spoken clearly so he wasn't good at learning their language he learned some of it uh, but he spent more time studying the bible than maybe he intended to originally and they were there and they were evangelizing for a number of years and nothing was happening nothing was happening and he started to get really troubled that nothing was happening nobody was getting saved and he started praying really in earnest supplication prayed and prayed and prayed all night work all day and pray all night and uh, they had a conference in one of the cities in northern india and he told the the people the other workers who were there about the burden of prayer and he said i believe god has spoken to me and we are to pray and believe god to save one soul every week in this whole of northern India and they prayed all of them got together and prayed and you know what happened the next year they were able to report that 400 people had been saved and baptized in northern India and he said yes this is only the start we must pray we must pray for two souls a week and they prayed for two souls a week and they got two souls we must pray the next year for three souls a week and they got three souls a week and that broke out into a revival which today spawned over a million converts in northern india and pakistan all came out of that so much fervor had he in prayer that he was nicknamed praying hide i grew up at bible college reading these stories you know by the way if you don't read christian biographies you'll miss them out really miss them stories of these great men of the faith praying hide I read a medical report on him he somehow managed to I think almost kill himself physically because his heart moved I don't know how it did this but from the left hand side to his right hand side caused some great great illness but that's another story there was a man a missionary a pastor who was working in that area John Hyde was concerned about him because he was kind of cold to the ministry kind of cold in his fervor I mean he was really upset by the spiritual coolness and coldness of this pastor so he began to pray and he said oh father you know how cold and he was just about to name the name of the man and he said it was as if a finger froze upon his lips stopped his lips from saying the man's name and Hyde was horrified as the spirit of God convicted him that he had judged this man harshly with a critical spirit and from that point on he determined not to focus on the shortcomings of others but take them to God shortcomings and all but take them to god as god's children whom god loved and the lord uh, impressed upon him to show him to bring to him the things that are of good reports just as it says in philippians 4 8 the things that are of good report think on these things and he praised god for the man's virtues and the man's character and qualities instead of all the negative things that he could have said Later on, Hyde learned that during this exact time, the pastor's spiritual life was revitalized. Revitalized. And may the Lord give us wisdom to know how to pray for others with kindness. How to treat others with kindness. Not criticism. Any jackass can criticize. No, that's not spirituality. We pray with love, not anger. Pray with grace, not judgment. May we learn at this church, may the Eckworth Church learn, may the sermon audio listeners learn to be grace givers, not fault finders. Mm. Grace givers, not fault finders. If there be any virtue, oh my, if there be any virtue, well, that's, that's amazing. If there be any virtue, arate, is the word there it refers to preeminence moral preeminence intellectual preeminence arte 
is a term denoting moral excellence. Arte came to mean a quality of life which made someone or something stand out as excellent. Arte was never meant to be a cloistered virtue and a hidden virtue, but a virtue which is demonstrated in life. And when anything in nature properly fulfills its purpose, that fulfillment was revered to as a virtue. Simple as this, if land, if a field produced a crop, it was excellent. It had this virtue because it was fulfilling its purpose. If your ducks lay eggs, there's a virtue there. That's excellent. That's this word, aren't they? And uh, Peter uses this same word to describe Jesus, who is the supreme manifestation of glory and excellence. He did everything. Jesus did everything he purposed to do. He purposed to obey the Father. He did it. He purposed to uh, fully preach the kingdom of God. He did it. He purposed to live for his bride, his church, to live for them. He did it. He purposed to go to the cross for his bride, to die for them. He did it. He purposed to rise from the grave, to bring his church with him into heaven. He did it. And he's purposed to come back for us, and he'll do it. Whatsoever things are a good report. Oh, my, my, my. Think on these things. Think on them. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue. Well, that's excellence. Listen, if there be any praise, you're coming near the end of this and you've listened well. Praise denotes commendation. Praise or approbation and officially approving. Did you know the basic word for praise is the word applause? If there's anything that we can applaud, think of these things. Well, when we applaud, do you know what? Have you ever applauded? You're giving your appreciation for well, that which is this performer. This performer has come on and he, he sung a song, she's sung a song, and you give it an applause. Recognition. Something you say it deserves to be praised. I was just thinking about it, and I can imagine when Jesus returned to heaven after the cross. Wow. He had accomplished redemption by pouring out his blood. I believe when he walked in, wherever it is, I can just see the angels standing and applauding, applauding, and everyone standing and applauding. The young prince of glory is home. The young prince of glory was born of a virgin. And 33 years ago, he went to the earth and he's accomplished his mission. Job accomplished. And they applaud. Oh, I can imagine that. So what comes to your mind when you ask, is it praiseworthy? Oh, is it worthy of your applause? Is Jesus worthy of your applause? Uh, years ago in church, we used to give him a clap offering every now and again. Yeah, we stand as a church and applaud. He's worthy. Well, you're becoming a charismatic McKee. Because I would applaud redemption. I'd applaud Jesus. Away with you. Mm -hmm. Isn't he worthy of applause? Yeah. Will you hear what the psalm said? I read this psalm. Psalm 145. I will extol, extol thee, O oh my God, my King. I will bless thy name forever and ever. What are you going to think about, folks? Here, think of it as Psalm 145. I will bless thy name forever. Do you ever take your Bible and get alone with the Lord? Well, pray this, for example. This is thinking some of the things that are worthy of applause. I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise thy works to another, and shall declare thy mighty acts. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty, and of thy wondrous works. And men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts, and I will declare thy greatness. They shall abundantly honor, utter the memory of things of great goodness, and shall sing of thy righteousness. 
The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He's slow to anger. He's of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom. And talk of thy power to make known to the sons of men thy mighty acts and the glorious majesty of thy kingdom. Oh, I love that. How would you like to live like that? And you can. You can. Think on these things, it says. Think on these things. You're not responsible for the way other people think, but you are responsible as a believer. Or the way you think. And each one of these categories that Paul has given us, that we've looked at tonight, you can look at them and say, forget it. Or you can say, that's nice. Or you can apply it. You have a thought program that will build a Christian mindset in you. Or you can accept the godless input of the world which will bring great impediment to your Christian walk. Think on these things, meditate upon them, dwell much on Jesus, and your mind will be transformed. And that is the gospel.